Hello and welcome to Hall of Fame Sessions. And today we have a very special session. So without further ado, let me introduce Leslie Brathwaite. He is a multiple Grammy winner. As I said, a Hall of Fame winner and a friend of Full Sail for many years. And um, without further ado, take it away, Leslie. How's everybody doing? Um, so yeah, like right off, right off top, if, if you guys have questions, um, and you know what would probably help me, Paul, is if you see a, a question that you feel like I should answer, if you cut in and just re just kind of say it to me so I don't have to kind of like be fishing on the screen to because these these messages move kind of fast. So sometimes I can't even catch the question. Good plan. Uh, yeah. So if you, you could throw the question at me, um, that way everybody gets to hear the question and I can answer it right away. Well, before you even start, we have a question that came up. Do you want to go right to the question? Let's go. Let's go to it. <laughs> okay. And Thomas asks, what is the best process to mix ad libs and vocals? Some would say that the tel say the telephone effect. Are there other ways around that or is there a different approach? Um, I think a lot of times it's specific to the material. And I think sometimes um, what you want to do is approach everything with a with an open frame of mind. Um, a lot of times I tend to focus on the lead first and then the ad libs, I treat them just as that, the ad libs, just something that's just kind of adding in some flavor and some, some help and some, you know, some support in parts. But a lot of times I don't try to, um, come up with these formulas and stick to a formula for every song. So I try to encourage students all the time. Don't, don't try to come up with these formulas like, okay, this is what I do with my ad libs and this is what I do with my lead. Sometimes you have to kind of adjust based on what's in front of you. And so a lot of times it's about treating the material specific to that material, seeing what you're working with, seeing what works and don't be afraid to try things. Don't, don't think that there's a lot of hard and fast rules. If for one particular song, your ad libs need to be super loud because that's what the artist wants. That's what they want. Um, for some songs, the ad libs need to be kind of low based on what the artist wa wants or what the song calls for. So a lot of times just kind of feed off the energy, see what you're working with, but don't, don't get into this mind frame that there's a specific way to mix. There's different styles, there's different ways. Me and fellow Hall of Famers or fellow alums, we all have different ways. I was, I was just on a stream last night with uh, Josh Goodwin and we were just talking about the different projects we were working on and fellow Hall of Famer Josh Goodwin. And we all have different ways of working and we feed off of each other and I might take a piece of what he said from here. And so kind of develop that style too. Don't just think that what I say of how I do ad libs is what you need to do. It's, it's just, you know, you just kind of feel it up. That's a great answer. We have actually more questions. If Let's I can just the shoot questions. them to you right I like here. The okay. questions. So, yeah. So I'm not sure how to pronounce, uh, is it Danielle? Something like that. Um, do you think it is recommended to let a recording artist record over an instrumental that might not contain all its pieces yet? Maybe all the samples and effects part are not perfect yet. Um. Unfortunately, that's a product of what we do. A lot of times we have to do that because of what's available, the time frame of the artist. The artist may be available before all the session players are or before the producer finished the track. Um, in an ideal world, it's better to have everything there because what you run into is, you know, say an artist comes in and records over something that's not finished they kind of get stuck to what they heard and what they recorded to or what they wrote to. And it's very, you know, we have that term uh, in the industry called demoitis. And it's very hard to get people away from the first thing they heard and the first thing they fell in love with. And a lot of times what happens is their vibe and their energy is created around what they heard. And then, you know, a few weeks later or whenever something comes back and it's got new strings and new parts and new stuff. And they're like, ah, that doesn't feel the same. So a lot of times that's dangerous territory that you run into. It's okay to add little sprinkles and things that wouldn't necessarily affect the vibe of the song or kind of throw them off. But a lot of times you can, you know, that, that can really mess with them. So that's a fine line to walk. And again, like I said, sometimes it's out of necessity. Sometimes you have to do it that way because of who's available or what's available. Um, Which leads so. us right into the next question. Uh, how, uh, comes from Jacob. How do you keep the artist input in mind while still implementing your own skills? 
Yeah, and that's the important thing is to remember for me as a mixer, um, and and even as producers sometimes, but as a mixer for sure, I got to remember I'm there to serve them. I'm I'm in the service industry. My job is to deliver the sound that they are looking for. And so the the biggest part of my job is to figure out how to translate what's in their brain into what we we put into the final product. And so my job is more so less about what I want to do and what I prefer, and it's more about what their vision is. Now, the thing is, over the years and as you grow in your career, your talent becomes a factor in that thought process. So earlier in my career, when I was mixing, it was more so about just whatever the artist wanted, whatever they're looking for, that kind of thing. At this point in my career, you know, 27, maybe 28, I can't remember, years in, Mm -hmm. um, now it's about people coming to me, knowing my reputation, knowing the work I've done, and wanting my input. And my input is a factor in their brain as to what the final product would be. So it's kind of gauging that and knowing how to navigate that and, and always keeping in mind, though, even at this stage in the game, for me, it's still what they want before what I want. There you go. Perfect. Well, we have a great question from Antonio here. I'm going to skip right to that one. Antonio asks, is there a rule of thumb to get the vocals to sit nice and loud in the mix? And the second part, in other words, is it hard to match like with how loud you want the snare or for that matter, even the kick and the 808 and all that? Um, so it, it depends. So sometimes, and I, I probably, you know what I should do? Let me, let me show you a little something here. Let me share my screen. Um... I can do that. Let me share the audio. And I can probably show you a little something. So can you guys see that? Are we seeing that? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of times what you do, this artist, his name is Lil Mosey. Um, and this is the track. It's at, This is actually a two track uh, mix where all they had was the two track and they sent me the vocals and the two track. Um, so what, you know, in, in this type of case, the answer to that question applies heavily because the two track is already blended. Um, A lot of times I'm really trying to get the vocal to really sit on top, to really sit up. Um, So a lot of times I just gravitate, this is my vocal master chain here. What you'll find is, um, this is something they put on the LA two way. They had this sound already there, but this guy, um, the Fairchild 670 Legacy, it's a UAD plugin. This guy is my friend. Um, this is one of those plugins that can really add some oomph. Um, it really brings the vocal out a lot of times. I use it on a lot of different t- things too. Basses, kicks, uh, it just depends. Um, let me play a piece of this just so you guys can get a sense of what we are listening to here. Uh, do I have it coming? I do not hear it. Yeah, we're not hearing audio right now. Okay, that might be... Um, my, my bad. I got to figure out why that is. And I think I know why. Uh, let's go here. We'll figure that out. Yeah, that's probably why. Let's go there. Probably need to restart that session. So let me, um, stop share and I'll figure that out, but I'll be able to kind of show you that once that loads back up. Uh, and I can take another question in the meantime. Sure. Um, Marcus asks, when trying to get the song to compare to mixes on the radio, is there a rule of thumb for analog or digital? I don't know if they mean mixing to analog or digital. And I hear you engineers say for that rich, full, warm, they go for analog. What's your take on that? Okay, so let's let's table that question. Hold on, let me make sure. Yeah, yeah. Are we playing? Can you hear it? Now we hear it. A little quiet, but we can hear it. Yeah, I, I don't think, I think I need to reshare my screen. So let me reshare. Oh, is it sharing still? Oh, it's still sharing. Okay, good. Sharing audio. Uh, so. You said it's quiet? It is very quiet and a little muffled. Ooh, I wonder why. But let's not get into all the technical stuff. I just want to kind of, I just want you guys to kind of hear the song. Um, still muffled? Yeah, we can, we can barely hear it. Um, I'm hearing muffled vocals and hardly any background. So, okay, that just gives you a sense of what the song contains. But like I was saying, this guy right here, the Fairchild 670 Legacy, 
that's your friend. And it's my friend. Um, it's a good um, tool. Any type of comp- and, and again, don't stick to just what I do. Any type of um, compressor, um, limiter, you, you know, play around with those things when it comes to your vocal chain. And so you've got an SSL channel right before that. Does that mean you've got uh, hitting the SSL and a fast, a faster attack and the, uh, the fair? Yeah, and it really, the SSL attack? is just to kind of pull off. If you see, I rolled off some of the low end here. Um, sure. A lot of times with vocals, vocalists, uh, most vocalists um, sing pretty close to the mic to try to kill out the room sound. But what that does is it, it then adds a lot of bass and bass tones to their voice that aren't naturally, you know, nobody really sits this close to everybody, you know, that kind of thing. So proximity really, effect can be pretty, pretty severe on, on yeah. those. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> so a lot of times you tend to roll off the low end. Uh, you can see here I roll off a lot of, a little bit of the high mids just to kind of kill the harshness because you have his vocal rolling through a heavy auto tune, heavy, yeah. uh, harsh EQ. So you want to sibilance up there at 6K. Yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty much it. And then, you know, my vocal chain. This is not typical of my vocal chain. Um, so they had this on, um, the C6. They had the LA-2A. And then they had um, this EQ punching up some of that sound that you notice they're boosting all the high mids, the high end, da 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 And instead of trying to work from a certain point, a lot of times what I like to do is leave their plugins on and then kind of work from there and figure out what I need to do to get the sound I'm looking for. So from here, these are my settings. So my de-esser, um, my compressor, do a little light compression, nothing. Yeah, the light. Renaissance is fantastic for vocals. Love that. Oh, it's amazing. It's the, yeah. it's the best. And yeah. then, like we said, into the SSL, Fairchild. And then I wanted a little top end sheen. So I go up to the frequencies, like the 27 um, Ks and not that we can hear 27 K, but this, a particular EQ kind of, you know, covers a, a spectrum up there. And then I just boosted a touch just to give it a little nice little top end sheen bite. And, you know, we're good there. Yeah, now, getting back to this, the second. Analog, yeah. yeah. Back to the question after. Uh, can you repeat the question, Paul? The last sure, question. sure. Essentially, it was an asking, uh, you're trying to get it compared to mixes that you hear on the radio. And do you need to have analog in the chain in any way? I think that I'm not sure if they mean analog tape or analog actually outboard gear. compressors. You know? Yeah, well, for me, I don't use any analog anything. I don't use analog gear. I don't, I'm, all I'm strictly in the box. I've been that way for the past, I want to say maybe 15 years now. Um, yeah. I think the first record I mixed totally in the box was in 2005. It was uh, Young Jeezy, uh, Thug, Thug Motivation 101. That record ended up going, I think, triple platinum, that album. Um, but that was the first project I mixed all in the box, been mixing in the box ever since. What, what, what we found and what you can find now is a lot of the plug-in companies make amazing tools that sound really good. The technology has evolved. So, you know, back in the 90s and the late 90s when Pro Tools was relatively new to all of us, it was hard for us to adjust to the analog gear that we had been working on and trying to move over into this digital world, it was hard because the stuff just wasn't sounding the same. It wasn't feeling the same. But then you got companies that came along like UAD, um, Universe Audio. Um, you got companies, obviously Waves. You got um, all these great, amazing plugging companies that have done such good work modeling the gear and really understanding how that fits in the digital realm. And it's been sounding amazing. Yeah. So, I, I can't live without all my UAD stuff. And yeah, and, oh, man. You know, it's like, it's, it's essential tools. Yeah, it, and so, I've been, I've been recently geeking on the, um, is it, uh, IK multimedia, a lot of their stuff, the T-Rack and all that. The T-Rack that they've come a long way. They used to be considered prosumer 10, 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. I remember when they started putting stuff out on like the iPad, the little stuff that you could play yeah. with on the iPad. And now it's like, they're, they're kind of competing. So amazing. Amazing. So that I, th I'm going to ask a question. We got a load of questions here, but I'm going to ask a quick question when we're talking about UAD, what happens if you get a session sent to you and it's got plugins that you do not own? Uh, well, right now, what I love about that question is that is one of the main ways I learn new things because what mm -hmm. happens is people send me sessions. It has a plugin or two that I don't have. So if I don't have it, Nine times out of 10, I haven't used it before or I'm new to it. So I immediately, 
I go to the page, I download it, I get it. I usually get all the plugins I don't have if a session comes to me. And then I start playing with it and learning. I remember there was a couple of plugins. There was one um, called the Tornado. I had never heard of it before it, that session came to me. Started playing around with it. I, I, I came, uh, the, the, the plugins we were just talking about, the T-Rack, the IK multimedia stuff. Um, I'd gotten a session with the T-Rack one on it. And I was amazed at how great it sounded and what it did. And I was like, oh, got to get this. And play, you know, add it to my arsenal and play around with that. So that's to me one of the most fun things is when I get sessions with plugins that I don't have. Because now I'm like, oh, what are they using? And it's the, the coolest thing ever is when you get sessions from like young producers and people who are way younger than me. Um, because that's the thing. Those are the things that trend. What, what the younger uh, generation is into you know, I'm 47 years old. So the reason I'm able to still mix Gunna and Lil Uzi Vert and all the stuff that the kids like and my nephews like and my kids like is because I stay in tune with what they're listening to. And so it's the same principle with the sessions where when I get sessions from these young producers who are like, you know, 15 and 16 and 17, I'm geeking out over all the stuff they're using because I'm like, ooh, this connects me to the young <laughs> So that's, that's kind of that brings mind. us right into the next question. Fernando asks, what are some mixing technique mistakes that you see often? Oh, I think the biggest mixing technique mistake that I've seen, especially from younger, um, you know, mixers and engineers and producers is gain staging. I, I, the biggest one, that's one of the biggest mistakes is the, the gain staging. You know, by the time the signal gets to a certain point, it's so distorted, it's so hot. Uh, it could be the other way too. Sometimes it's a little way too low, but more than more often than not, the problematic things is when the signal is just way too hot, when things are recorded at too hot a level, um, or when things are mixed with no gain staging in mind. And by the time it gets to a certain plugin, it's slamming the plugin and it's really coloring the sound. And you know, so gain staging is one of the things I usually see the biggest issues in distortion. Um, do you pull it back with clip gain, or do you do it with a, a gain plugin? I do clip gain, clip gain, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I just try to back things down and, you know, start from, I try to work my way backwards. I reverse engineer where the problem went wrong um, and just try to, you know, sort it out. And one thing I always do when I get sessions from people that are, um, that have those kind of mistakes, I think the, the educator in me, the, the, the person who loves to do these kind of things, the, the, the lecturer, I guess, I always try to reach out to that engineer or producer or mixer and kind of teach them or tell them what I'm doing to correct. Like I show them where they messed up. I walk them through, I send them a copy of my session with my stuff on it so they can kind of learn how I did. That's it. great. That's, I think that's, that's amazing. The important thing too is not to just like get a session and be mad at all the mistakes they've made. It's also about helping them along so that they don't make the same mistake. Yeah, teaching moment, absolutely. So I'm going to ask another question besides all the ones in the and I'm seeing your levels on in your Pro Tools session are really relatively low that they came to you that way. Um, is that is that because you minimize the uh, waveform or is that the way they come? Uh, I think that's a minimize of the waveform. And if we could kind of, let me just play a little bit of it. You can see oh, that, where they're hitting on the hot. meters. The track is hot. Okay, yeah, I got it. So it's not so low, okay. Yeah, pretty, pretty basic levels. Okay. Um, Good. These are levels that look. I think it's more so a product of me minimizing the waveforms. Got it. Um, okay. Yeah, and if and as you can see, if you, even when you look on the vocals, like these are the clean vocals. I have the clean vocals um, um, unmuted. These are like you know on the vocal itself. A um, couple of plugins here. Couple, this is the auto tune, but I don't use a ton, a ton of plugins. I try. I'm a real minimalist. I don't try to go too much. I don't try to do too much. That's just my style and the way I do things. I agree. I agree. And and speaking of which, is this is kind of a normal session for you that not not a mass amount of plugins? Is that um uh I forgot where I was going with this. Uh oh yeah, let's just go to a question. I had something. Okay, it'll come back <laughs> to me. The train of thought. Okay, yeah, yeah. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> There's too many things going on. Okay. Uh this is a good question from uh looks like seam. I think it looks like, when do you know when to give your ears a break and not to mess with the mix so much and stay fresh? Yeah. Um, I tend to take a lot of breaks. I've learned over the years that a lot of times when you, when you get into second guessing mode, when you start kind of messing with something too much, 
when you start saying to yourself, hmm, should I turn this up? Should I turn this down? Should I do this? Should I do When you start going through those phases in your mind, it's either time to take a break or sometimes that's actually the same theory I use to when I know I'm done with the mix. When, when I start trying to second guess too many moves, that's kind of when I know, okay, maybe I need to back off from the mix, take a break, come back on fresh airs. Usually the problem that was bugging you when you kept waffling back and forth it kind of sometimes magically disappears when you take a break. So I take a lot of breaks. I try to refresh my ears often. I always tell people the way our brains work and the way our hearing works. If I say the word Colgate to you 50 times, by the 20th time, the word itself starts sounding funny. So you got to just take breaks. You got to chill. You got to know how to just, and, and it doesn't have to be long breaks. It could just be a simple get up, go to the bathroom, wash my hands, you know, hang out for two seconds and then come back. Um, if you have an Apple watch or for me, I use, I always use the, the Apple watch as a good gauge of, cause you can get locked in and you can sit there and start tweaking stuff and da, 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 and then the Apple watch always tells me it's time to stand up. And I'm like, yeah, breathe. Right, cool. It's time to yeah. stand up. Yeah. Breathe. <laughs> Which brings us beautifully to a question by Robert. Um, I noticed that in your credits that you worked with WAP with Cardi B, of course. Mm-hmm. And, and, and this is the, the detail. The question is great in the, in a heavily repetitive instrument beat track, how does engineering differ differ from engineering a heavily diverse arrangement? Do you think that this this limits your engineering creativity when you have a just the same repeating beats over and over again? Oh uh, no, because I mean this is kind of what I do. It's what I train to do. It's the music I love. I love hip hop. Hip hop it, it, the basis of hip hop is built on a four bar, eight bar loop. Um, with some sprinkles here and there. So, I mean, my ears are and my brain are trained to that. It's about, uh, of course, with, with WAP, the most interesting thing on that song is the, is the, is the lyrics. So you're, you're, you're paying attention to how vulgar the lyrics are or what she's saying or how crazy, you know, all of that kind of stuff is the energy in the song. It's really Cardi and Megan. They are the ones that are the energy. They're like another instrument on the song. Mm-hmm. And so with the track, um, it's just really about making it beat, making it, make it, just make sure that whoever's listening to that track feels something every time that kick thumps, that bass thumps. It's, it's a feel thing. It's not even about what you're hearing or what things you get to play with. It's about a feel thing. So, you know, you have your songs where you have a ton of tracks and a ton of different arrangements going on and you get to play around and tinkle around. And, and in those cases, I work section by section. But in a song like WAP, you just, you know, it's all about feel. It's what, it's the feel that I'm either trying to create or maintain. Yes. And that, so that segues, you were talking about bass and kick drum. Um, the, um, it looks like Danielle, uh, it looks like, what do you think is the most critical part of the creative process in terms of mixing or mastering? I think the most critical part actually is to the communication between me and the producer, me and the artist, me and the A&R. Well, the most critical part is the stuff that happens before the mix, in my opinion. So, for instance, there's a, there's a process. I always say, like, there's steps to mixing. And a few of the first steps don't have, they have nothing to do with the board or the computer or the, the music. The first steps is communication. I got to figure out what, the, and even before I figure out what they want, I got to figure out who's in charge. That's the first thing. First thing you want to do in any scenario is figure out who's in charge. Who's going to be approving this mix? Who's the most influential creative person in this process? Because it differs in different um, scenarios. There's some artists where it's a new artist and they sign to the label. The artist doesn't really know. The A&R at the label is the one that's taking a creative direction. Sometimes it's the producer that has the artist signed to them and then they have a deal with the label and the producer is the real creative person who I'll be answering to as far as a mix. That happens when you have the super producers like Pharrell or Timbaland or those, you know, Swiss Beats. Those guys are usually the ones that are the creative um, epicenters of the whole thing. Then you have, when you work with your bigger artists like a Beyonce or, you know, Pink or, you know, they are the ones, you know, if you're working on a Beyonce record, she's the one that's approving everything. So you got to figure out who's in charge, who's approving the mixes, And then the second thing is you got to communicate with them and figure out what they want. I think that's, to me, that's probably the most paramount um, part of the process is figuring out exactly what this person wants, what they're trying to achieve, why they hired you. What, what are we trying to get here? And then the story they're trying to tell, what's the story they're trying to get. Yeah. And then from there, it's about you applying your craft and 
But I, I think I honestly think that's probably the most important part of it is figuring out what they want. Yeah. So Tyrell brings up a great question that segues right into there. What project was your most challenging one and how did you navigate through it? Um, you know, um, I have different projects that had different challenges. Um, two, when you say challenges, two things really jump out to mind. Um, I worked on Michael Jackson's, um, history album in 95. I, I was um, one of the mixers on They Don't Care About Us. It was me and Bruce Swedeen. And it was just a very interesting and challenging situation for a lot of reasons. A, this is the person who pretty much I read the back of his records and wanted to do what I'm doing. So, and then of course, meeting Bruce Swedeen on that trip was, I was more nervous to meet Bruce than I was Michael, to be honest. With you. I was a huge <laughs> Michael fan, but when you're meeting the guy who was the king of what you want to do. Yeah. He's amazing. Yeah. That was, in, it was so intimidating, but he made it so great. He was so warm, but became good friends. But um, so then you have, so you have that, you have that pressure of this is Michael Jackson. This is the number one artist ever to walk the face of the earth, arguably. And then you got Bruce Swedeen, this guy that I look up to. So it is that swirling around in my head. And then it's, Michael and the way he works. And he, we, it took us six months to mix that record. I, wow. you know, he, he just kept going back and forth. And even when we got back to Atlanta, he was calling and saying, hey, can we change this? Can we add some sticks? Or can we knock two pencils together and record that and see how that sounds? And it was just, you know, so it was such a process, but it wasn't difficult from a standpoint of, it wasn't bad or negative. It just was so much pressure and so many changes and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, Can you put yourself back on the screen? It's great to hear you talk and see you a little bit. I'd like I'd, oh, I'm I'd sorry. to put I'm, yourself back yeah, on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the Pro Tools is cool. There you go. Beautiful. There okay. We go. Hey, guys. Hey. So, I, thought you, I thought you guys could see me the whole time. Yeah, you could. They could in a little box in the corner. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's just good to see your, uh, your full expressions. Okay. So two questions came up about mono. Okay. One is, uh, what are your thoughts about, and this came from Mika, what are your thoughts about mixing in mono con to control the low end? Like whether you, you know, just do a, a, where I'll let you answer that actually. Yeah. My, my brain doesn't work that way. Um, I understand the technique. I've learned some things from that technique, but I just, my brain just cannot work that way. I just, I don't even, um, I've never really done it on a professional level for anything I've been doing. It's not something I focus on. I think it mattered more in the older days when, um, a certain things were translated in mono, like on you know mono radio stations or whatever. Or B, um, the type of equipment and the type of um, tools that everybody had to work with to monitor certain things. Now we have plugins that can monitor things that we can that we would have had to check in mono type of thing. So right. no, I, it's just not my thing. It, I, I, I think, think maybe maybe they were steering the question towards like a a multi um, a multi band compressor where you can you know put the bass in mono kind of thing. I'm not sure if they're um, yeah. That's I typically don't. Um, I usually just deal with what's there. If the bass comes in stereo or if it comes on two tr you know tracks, um, essentially it's a mono sound. If it's just mono but on two tracks. Um, I, I don't, I don't harp on trying to put things in mono and checking them and all like, I don't, I don't really harp on that to be honest. Okay. So that answers Troy's question, which should you pan first or after when mixing in mono or should you do a little bit of both depending on the Yeah, project? it depends. And I'll tell you, I've made those, um, I guess you can call it mistakes where like, you know, sometimes you get a kick track and the kick track comes on a stereo track, but it's a yeah. mono kick. Yeah. And sometimes that stereo track is panned up in the middle, so it just makes the kick super loud. Super loud. And I've actually mixed that way where I didn't even think to check. And then I was like, well, I'm going to leave it that way because I started that way. Or yeah. I panned it out and it doesn't do anything because it's a mono sound. So Same thing, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so sometimes, you know, I, I don't get too far in my head about those kind of things. That's good. Yeah, yeah. I always tell tell everybody that you know if you start with good sources, then then a lot of these questions just go away. It's when exactly. you, when you're starting with you know not good sources, then that's when you re, that's when you start pulling your hair out and get into trouble. Yeah. Exactly. So, okay. Uh, Amory says, uh, how would you recommend completing a song's production lyrically when while establishing the flow and structure? Where do you draw the line between the average lyrics and the great lyrics to match the already strong hook? 
Hmm. That's a complicated question. Um, I think I, I think that is a very subjective question. I think it's song by song, but I think what you I think this this advice probably can apply to a lot of things. Again, no one piece of advice applies to everything. But when you have a really strong hook and you're trying to figure out, okay, what verses, what can complete the song in, in the verses and the rest of the writing, da da da. I think the best rule of thumb is to not overthink it. I think <laughs> simple always works best. And sometimes it doesn't even matter. When you listen to some of the biggest hits of all time, like <laughs> let's go with Michael Jackson. Like you listen to Beat It and Billie Jean and you really break down what those songs are saying. You're like, huh? You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's not about, you know, Billie Jean or Beat It wasn't about some type of noble um, prize winning lyrics. It was just a feel. It was, you know, or when you look at um, it, it's, and I, I'm picking on Michael because <laughs> it's, th those records were so big and so mm -hmm. large, you know, for, for half the eighties, most of us was walking around saying the wrong lyrics to um, mama say, mama say, mama say. Like, <laughs> I, I, I probably said 50 different sentences to that. Yeah. I was saying the wrong lyrics for like three years. So yeah. it proves yeah. the point that not saying, I don't, I don't want this to be misinterpreted. I'm not saying that lyrics don't matter. I'm saying there's context. And a lot of times the simplest answer tends to be the best one. Yeah. It's more about the feeling than the actual. Yeah. yeah anything else. Yeah. Cool. Uh, okay. Here's a really uh, technical question for TJ. What tools and tricks would you recommend for mixing with vocals over a two track to create space in the track without killing too much of the mids? Um, to be honest with you, um, that's an interesting question to answer. But again, that question is subjective to the material because I can give you an answer that applies to, the mix I have up, that's a two track that these vocals are here. And it, to me, it's not really about creating so much space, but it's about just making sure everything feels and sounds good. And sometimes don't get too, here's, here's the one thing I would tell you that isn't really the technical part of the question. Don't get too far in your head about the fact that it's a two track mix. And that's the thing. A lot of people start shooting themselves in the foot early because they go, oh, it's a two track mix. I have to create space. I have to do these things. I Sometimes it just feels damn good. And right. sometimes you might not be following all the rules, but it, what's there just feels good. So don't get too far in your head about it's a two-track mix. So mm -hmm. now I got to do X, Y, and Z. Sometimes it's a two-track mix and it sounds fine. Yeah. So. And that leads us right into, uh, again, I can't pronounce her name, Danielle. Danielle, uh, would you ever put a limiter on the master track if there's only a minimal amount of peaks and so you would avoid a gain reduction as, or would you avoid gain reduction as much as possible? Um, to be honest with you, I'm not big on putting limiters on, on my master tracks. I think that I like to leave a lot of that um, work and room for the mastering engineer. So I'm one of the, I think I'm more of an old school mentality where I like to keep my master fader and my master track pretty bare. And I let, I print at a fairly low level, like minus six, sometimes even a little lower, just to give them some headroom and let them kind of work all that out and let them do the limiting. And, the, you know, cause the, the, it, it makes their job easier and it, it, it's also more efficient for them to be able to do certain things when they have all the limiting uh, capabilities. If they get something that's pretty limited or pretty squashed by the time they get it, that kind of limits how they work. Um, the what do you deliver to them? Uh, uh, 24, 44, one, or what do you deliver to them? Uh, we deliver 48, um, 24 bit, 48 K is usually okay. what most mastering engineers these days cool. want cool. and like. So that's right. usually what I deliver. Cool. Tyrone asks, what is your magical tool to complete your mix? Uh, my magical tool is I turn the volume really down really low and I close <laughs> my eyes. Mm. My magical tool. Uh, I have two of them and they're attached to my head. My mm -hmm. ears, and that's it. Um, I just turn the music down, close my eyes. Um, I listen. And if I can somehow pull out the feel and the sounds and everything at a low volume, I know I've done my job. Right. 
I find I love to check my mixes on my iPad and then on my Airbud Pros and, and you know, in, in the car and everything. Do you drive yourself crazy with many, many different speaker systems or not really? Um, I, I do do the car check. The car check is like essential, which yeah. will, will lead me into something I'll talk about right after this. Right. Um, the car check is essential. I check on my phone a lot and I check on like earbuds and stuff because the thing is to, to always try to keep up with what most people consume music on. And most people listen to their music in their earbuds, on headphones, on their phones, on their laptop speakers. So it's important to kind of check around and see. Um, but listening, check it in the car is, is, that's old school. It still works. Mm -hmm. Most, a lot of people consume music in their cars. Um, and, and a side note, so because of that, so for, for COVID, um, I haven't been, going to the studio because when I left um, Full Sail for Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. when I came back, that's when the lockdown started. That's right. We had a couple of people at the studio had tested positive. So we were like, okay, we're not going to the studio. We shut mm -hmm. it down. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was at home and I don't have a treated room at home, but I had to get some mixes done. And I was like, you know, I always check the mixes in the car. Mm -hmm. Let me go mix in the car. There you so go. I set up in the car, um, plugged in my aux to the car system. Mm -hmm. and mixed the record and I really loved it and then I got like obsessed and then I put my Focal speakers in the car <laughs> my KRK sub in the truck I have an Escalade so it's a lot of room in there wow. and I have a whole setup in my truck I'm still mixing on that setup so I mixed WAP on that setup wow. I mixed uh, Jack Harlow um, What's Popping on that setup Jack Harlow's What's Popping went number four WAP went number one um, had some really good mixes in that on that setup uh, still mixing on it to this day in the car, in the truck. Um, so, so you're bringing your laptop and, and how are you plugging in your UAD interface into the... So I have, so now I do have power in my truck, but what I'm doing is I usually back the truck out of the garage a little bit just so the exhaust is, you know, coming out. Yeah, you get, and you get power. And then um, I have a power strip that I plug in to the garage right? and I bring it in the truck and then I plug in the UAD, the speakers and all that. And I just have a little setup in there. And I'm just in there mixing. And it's fun because it's like my own little office. I can make as much noise as I want. Nobody can really hear it. You know, it doesn't disturb the house. And when you think of it, um, it turned out to be such a good environment because the cars are designed with that in mind. They're designed to try to keep um, with acoustics in mind. They don't want a lot of road noise. There's no parallel surfaces in there. Even the windows are kind of caved. Even the harder surfaces are, are kind of angled so that nothing's really bounced. It's a really good environment to mix it. And yeah, yeah, I discovered that's a, a great that's a, that's a great technique. I think I think that should really be utilized as much as possible. I do very something very similar. I used to have you know before COVID, I would always have my clients and my vocal thing here, and now I literally run wires down uh, you know right to my driveway, right below my studio is a driveway. And uh, I run cables down there and they literally are singing with an RE20, an electric voice RE20. Handheld, I put a filter on top of it, a, a mask on top of it. And they're literally getting professional vocals out, out of their car because they're, again, it's a beautiful uh, space. It's a great environment. That's, and, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, COVID has taught us, you know, how to work differently and figure out some new things and it's fun. Yeah. Okay. A uh, okay. We're going to, there's so many questions here and so many great questions here. What can be done with your initial mix when, I'm sorry, what can be done when your initial mix is done and your stereo out is pushing minus three? Um, for me, uh, if it's not distorting, I don't, I'm not shy for minus three. Is, is it, I guess I, the question I would ask is what is the problem with minus three? Like, is, is there some problem that they're hearing or that they don't want or they want right. a specific Not enough room for the mastering engineer to work with. I guess that would be the thought. Yeah. yeah um, I, I've had mixes push at minus three and even a little higher, and they still have room to work with. They, you know, there's a lot of headroom there. So I think they're asking, maybe they're asking, I'm reading into it, but maybe do you either, you know, group the faders and pull them down or do you pull the master fader down a, two, a few dBs? That depends. That depends on where the chunkiness. So, for instance, if all the faders are feeding into the master and I feel like it's just too compact, it's, I'm at the brink of distortion, I will back all the faders down relatively. Yep. If it's just a thing of I want to just give him a little more headroom, but I like how everything sounds and fits, yeah. I'll just back the master fader down just a little That's bit. That's it. And there again, you're trusting your ears and trusting your instincts is the yeah. main thing. 
Okay. And that brings us up to Chris asks, uh, how do you know which order to use your plugins when mixing, if that makes sense? Uh, it's based on, uh, that's a really good question. So the order of the plugins for me is based on my way of thinking, the way I think and the way I EQ and the way I approach any sound, not just EQing. I always approach a sound, a song, a track, anything with this mentality. What do I not like about this? That's what I'm removing first. So I, I have a very subtractive method of working. So for instance, so say I got a vocal. First thing I always pretty much notice on vocals is if it's singing, I can't even work on the vocal unless it's tuned correctly. If it's not tuned, mm. it sounds like nails on a chalkboard to me. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't even work for me. So for me, that then dictates that usually if it's singing and it needs some tuning, the first plugin is usually the auto tune. Then I get to the problems. For, in most cases, if you have vocals that require DSing or have harsh S's, that's usually the first thing I want to get rid of. So I DS. And then I do a little light compression because I want to kind of con control things a bit. Mm -hmm. And then I EQ to try to remove some of the low end. And then after I do all of that, I may want to add some presence or some oomph to the vocal. That's when I go to my um, my uh, Fairchild uh, compressor or, or, you know, I, I pick different ones sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of, that mentality is kind of what walks me through which plugin I use first or last. It's about what I, what I want to remove or what I can stand to hear first or last, that kind of thing. Right, which leads into this question perfectly. I found that the more EQ you introduce to the chain, the more phasing issues within the mix starts uh, occurring. What is a good workflow to deal with when tracks that need a lot of subtractive EQ without introducing phase issues? Is there a nonlinear EQ worth using? Um, it depends. Um, I try to use, um, well, what tends to work for me um, is I just don't do, I don't take a lot of drastic steps. What you will find is, most of the stuff you have or most of the stuff you get, especially on, on more so now on, my, on the level I'm at now, I get really good recorded stuff. However, there's stuff that comes that sounds terrible or is recorded terrible. You know, all these artists got Pro Tools on their laptops now, so they think they're engineers and they record everything at home and sometimes it sounds bad. But what I find is subtle moves tend to work. Mm. And I think what happens with EQing is initially when we start out, we tend to want to make bigger moves and do mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. I tend to find that as I've gotten more seasoned in my career, that subtle moves tend to work out best. Mm -hmm. Doing little increments here, little increments there, you realize that you didn't need to pull back that much of the so-and-so or, you know, so subtle moves tend to tend, in yeah. my opinion, tend to kind of help. Curve yeah, let the back. tracks do what they're supposed to do. And don't try. Yeah. And I, I noticed a lot of I get a lot of student mixes where they throw everything on everything, and they're trying to fix. And they, and lots of times I just say pull every plug in up off and pull every fader down and start over because they're literally they back themselves so far into this hole that it's just, exactly. Yeah, you know, it's like okay. Yeah. Um, you know, let's switch out of technical for a second and let's get into your career because this is a great question, uh, okay. for, especially for students that are about to graduate. After graduation, how did you continue your career and accomplish what you've accomplished? Did it take a lot of sacrifices? Did you have to move around a lot? Um, so here's the thing, and and I'll tell a piece of my story, but I want to preface it by the obvious, which is everybody's story is different. Um, mm -hmm you know, every path is going to be different, but there are some basic things that you can take away from my story that I think applies to every story. So when I graduated Full Sail, I graduated in 1992. So let's, let's start there. Mm -hmm. The world was different. Studio culture was different. How you get into the business was a little different. Um, back then, graduated from Full Sail in 92. I moved to Atlanta. I had read that uh, Dallas Austin, the producer, was um, starting up a studio here. I figured that was a good opportunity. I felt like Atlanta was on the bubble. So I was like, you know, I didn't want to go to LA and New York or Nashville. Atlanta was on the bubble. I was like, let me move to Atlanta and try it out. Found a studio, started interning. So my mentality was, and, and this was the path for a lot of engineers who are my colleagues now, who kind of start, who, in the, you know, we started our careers in the 90s, late 80s, that kind of thing. 
you go in, you intern, you do all the grunt work, go get coffee, go get food, do whatever you got to do to stay around and just help out. And in return, I just got to stay around and be a fly on the wall and learn and see what other people were doing and kind of work my way up. And I was always, here's the key. And this, this is the thing. So everything I just said, most mm-hmm. of it wouldn't apply to today's thing. Right. Right. This thing I'm about to say applies, which mm-hmm. is in any system where you're trying to work your way up, always pay attention and try to get good at the next job. Hmm. What a lot of people tend to do is, oh, I graduated from Full Sail. I got a degree. You know, I want to be Leslie Brathwaite. Mm -hmm. I want to mix records. It doesn't work like that. Mm -hmm. When you graduate from Full Sail, and even though you paid a lot of money for your degree and everything else, if you get into a studio environment, Mm -hmm. the next person you want to be like immediately is the assistant, Mm -hmm. the assistant engineer. Mm-hmm. And then when you're an assistant, the next person you want to be like is that recording engineer and so on and so forth. If it, it usually moves in that hierarchy, it's usually mm-hmm. intern, assistant engineer, um, recording engineer, mix engineer. It usually tends to work that way. So my point is don't pay attention to the end game so much as you pay attention to the next step. Mm. That's what makes you climb the ladder fast is when you put your all and you make the next step. Because what people are doing the whole time, your whole life is going to be one big job interview. That's pretty Mm. much what, (laughs) you know, freelancing is. Exactly, exactly. Your whole life is one big job interview. Everything you do sets you up to do the next thing. Everybody you work with is is coming to you going, like I just recently got a call from David Guetta mixing some records for him right now. I've been wanting to work with David Guetta forever. Mm, mm. I figured it would just come into my world somehow. And then he calls and goes, hey, man, I heard WAP and I really wanted to work with you. So that was my job interview. And you don't do much dance music. That's hardcore club music. You don't do much straight up club, right? No, no. So I was was excited when he called. We were on um, Rita Ora. We're working on her album right now. So nice. I'm excited to be working with him and her. I love her. Um, I think she's she's going to be huge. It's, nice. I think she's, she's there to have that breakout record. But working with him was like a, a goal of mine. And yeah. for him to call and say, hey, man, I heard WAP and I really wanted to work with you. That was my calling card. That was the thing that I worked on last that I put my all into. Yeah. That was like my job interview to work with him. That's so incredible. that's the thing I always tell people is focus on what you're doing at the moment and focus at the very next thing you want to get to that leads you to that ultimate thing. Still keep your eye on the ball. If you want to be a mixer one day, absolutely keep practicing your craft. Absolutely keep, you know, going online and looking at all the full sale content and pensados and everybody else. But also pay attention to that next job that's right in front of you that you got to work towards to get to. That's you know. fantastic advice. That is fantastic advice. So th- this question came in really early. I think it brings it up right now is if you're an intern in a studio and your boss is very rude to you, what do you suggest that the intern does to? Um, don't take it personal. Um, yeah, that's it. That is one of the, um, I, I read this, I've read this book so many times it was recommended to me a few years ago. It's called The Four Agreements. Mm-hmm. One of the agreements in that book is not to take things personal. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I forgive I, you for I, being critical is what I hold in my head besides that. I forgive you <laughs> for being critical. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't take it in personal. In my own mind. In my own mind. Yeah. Yeah. Don't take it personal. Just yeah, yeah. understand that that's part of what you have to do. I do. I will say that what I've always done is I've always drawn a line between what I'm willing to accept from people as long as it's not any raw type of disrespect as long as you're not like you know spitting in my face or calling me of course you know derogatory names or da 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 there's we all have our personal levels of respect but if somebody's just yelling at you or mad at you or fussing at you in a in a you know reasonable way or whatever that's a lot of times just an indictment on their insecurities or something that's going on with them if you know you've done everything you were supposed to do and you're just not getting along with somebody in a, a, um, a higher position, sometimes it's just a product of them. Or sometimes the thing that a lot of people don't want to hear is sometimes that's an indictment on you. Sometimes mm. you're not doing something right. Sometimes you, you are messing up. 
Sometimes yeah. you aren't doing what you're supposed to be doing. So a lot of people don't like to swallow that pill either. So yeah. it, it, it's, I think those are moments where you look at yourself, you say, hmm, am I being the best person I could be? Should I be doing something better? And if you feel like you honestly check those boxes and that person is just ridiculous, then you just got to be like, that's on them. And you find a way to work through it. I've worked with difficult clients. I mean, I mean, for Christ's sake, I've worked with Kanye West. Mm. You know, say more. Of course. Of know? course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So my question to you, even though we have amazing questions here, is uh, what I love about your career is that you focused on being the best mixing engineer and people knowing you as this guy that's going to make our record sound like a hit record. So how did you become, instead of the jack of all trades, how did you become so focused on what you do amazing? How did that come about? Um, you know, I think for me, I, I always felt like, and I feel this way about anybody doing any job, which is when you figure out what your gift is, when mm -hmm. you figure out what your calling is, when you, mm -hmm. figure out, when you figure out these things that really speak to you, it's about investing the time and, the, you know, because any, like, for instance, Kobe Bryant, um, RIP, or mm -hmm. LeBron mm -hmm. James, or any mm -hmm. of these great ball players, or any mm -hmm. great person that plays sport, Tom Brady, they will tell you, yes, they have God-given talent. They have talent that's just there. But what makes them successful is they work really hard at it, mm. you know? Michael Jordan, all of them, all the greats, they work really hard at it. They're in the gym shooting all the time, practicing mm -hmm. all the time. So for me, it was, I knew I had a talent. I knew I had an ear. I knew I could hear these things and feel these things. And now it's about, I got to practice. I got to practice. Mm -hmm. So as an in, even as an intern, going back to my intern days, um, one of my jobs was, okay, Dallas and all the crew, they would go to the clubs all night. Yeah, And my thing was, as soon as they leave, I mm -hmm. make sure that studio is spotless, mm -hmm. cleaned up the studio. And then I would ask Dallas, I asked Dallas one time, hey, um, Dallas got this, um, they were commissioned to do these remixes for Bob Marley and everybody, all the top producers at the time were doing these remixes. Mm -hmm. So he had got a reel of jamming, the Bob Marley song jamming. Yeah. He got it a, a 24 inch reel. So mm -hmm. I asked him, I said, hey, you mind if I copy that to a shop tape? Mm -hmm. And that was a reel that was in the you know sure. shop and you just sure. use it for tones or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I said, you mind if I copy that to a shop tape and just use that for my personal practice? And he was like, mm -hmm. sure. And so I always made sure my job was done first, clean the right. studio, spick and span, and they would be out clubbing all night and I would be in the studio. I've, I've probably mixed jamming at least a million times. <laughs> I, I would just mix it and then I would pull the faders down and mix again. And I would try approaching it from doing the vocals first or doing the drums first or doing the so-and-so. And that was my Friday and Saturday nights. Most of the time I would just be in there practicing, practicing, practicing. 10,000 hours. Yeah. yeah. And they were going to the club and I was exactly. right behind that board practicing. So, yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, I'm going to go with this question. Uh, Yancy actually has uh, a lot of good stuff to say. Um, I recently read that you use your eyes when mixing. For example, you said that you usually could just tell where a curse word was just by looking at the waveform. How long did it take you to develop that skill? <laughs> well, I, and let me clarify. I don't do that as that's not a tool. That's just yeah, yeah. a skill that comes with the job. Yeah. You look that's at waveforms long enough. You start yeah. to know what certain words look like. Yeah, right? yeah, but yeah. I don't use that as a tool. I don't go, hmm, let me look for all the curse words. No, I still, <laughs> listen, I still use my ears. But it's, it's just fun to be able to, you, you do something long enough and you're like, oh, I can tell that he said the S word right there. Yeah. And yeah. The so-and-so word right there. So now it's just, uh, you develop that over time. You sit in front of a screen and look at waveforms and listen long enough. And your ears and your eyes and your brain make this connection over and over again every day you know so many hours a day you it, it becomes kind of like a second language it's like it's almost like you're seeing the matrix on the screen um so yeah you do it enough and you you, you that's know, it edit that's enough it. vocals and you you get it <laughs> yeah and i think for me it's i think in the hip-hop world it's a skill that a lot of us hip-hop engineers and engineers that do mix a lot of hip-hop we develop because there's a lot of curse words, you know, so we always have to do clean versions where there's some genres where clean versions aren't the norm. Yes, you have curse words in country music or you have certain, you know, genres like, you know, different genres that I'm sure have curse words, but I don't think there's any genre that has more cursing and profanity than hip hop. 
And so it's a, a part of our nature to have to edit the clean version every time. Right. So you just develop that skill of looking for the curse word or editing the curse word and you start to know what they look like. Yeah. So I, actually, that was an exact question that came up. Can, and he, I don't know if you can do this, but can you show me how to clean the curse words out of a song? Sure. Yeah. Hey, let me screen share and show yeah, you yeah. right now. Cause there you go. Song had some curses. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we're back to it. So, and this, we don't even have to do much audio. I can actually just show you like, right. Let me try to find a place where, okay. So it's as simple as, wait, let me find an obvious one. Cause this might not be a great example. Cause he doesn't curse much. So I feel like it might have been a word or two. Yeah, so for instance, so these tracks down here are the, the, the pink tracks are my clean vocals and these tracks up here are the dirty vocals. So it's literally simple as just, and let's see if I can tell what he said. Oh, so he said, so he said, F you when I want to. And so I just took out the F. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you know, what, you know what it means. I'm trying to be family friendly on the full sale stream. So, but yeah, no, you, no. Know, you know what he said. And so yeah. that's all it, it was, is right there. This is the yeah. F word. Yeah. Um, that's kind of what the F word tends to look like. Uh, and, yeah. and interestingly enough, different artists pronounce the F word in particular, their waveforms look different. <laughs> usually tell other words, but the F word for some reason, different artists, I don't know if they hold the F longer or what. So yeah, yeah, it's just as simple as I select the track. So I could do it up here just to show you what I did. So I'll select the word or the part of the word that I want. And then usually I'll do like, uh, oh no, uh, mute it first. And then to, oh, what is going on? Sorry. And then to kind of make sure this transition is a little smooth. Sorry, I'm doing the most here. I think I have some type of mode going on. But anyway, mm -hmm. no, I'll do a smooth transition to where it looks like this. So you have a, a smooth transition going into the next word. And it's just that simple. And sometimes I don't even do the smooth transitions because it's hip hop and you want it to sound a little grungy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll just um, sometimes I'll just mute the word and just do a hard mute and let it go. So it, it kind of, sometimes you want it to have that grungy feel. Sometimes you want it to be a little, you know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. harsh and you kind of want them to know you cursed. So a lot right. of times I tell people like people like to replace the clean versions with a clean word and da da da. Yeah. I tend to not like that because it sounds corny. I like, I, 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 I'm, I'm of the school of thought of if it's meant to be grungy, you want them to know you cursed. You just can't curse. Yeah. So let's just take, let's just mute the word. Yeah. Well, I mean, Kanye and Jamie Foxx did it really well on, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, old, yeah. Uh, boy, yeah. They did it, did it really well. Um, let me think where we go here. There's, uh, how do you know which order to use the plugins when mixing, if that makes sense? How, which order? Oh, I think we covered that. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah we covered just that. based on yeah. my subtractives. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, and there's so many great questions. I, I don't even know where to start here. Uh, what inspired you to be? No, let's not go there. Um, vocal chain. We went there. Okay. What is your motivation to keep going when you come across obstacles along the way in your career? Hmm. Um, I always go. It, it, uh, it always breaks down to the bare bones of it, which is my love for music that I love music. Um, I love being creative. Um, so for me, that always gets me through. There's nothing about this industry or the business that will deter me from loving music. So, um, yeah, I just absolutely love music. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. That's true. Yeah. So I, I, actually a question came up in my head is that do you ever need to open up Melodyne to either, even not even for tuning, but to do like Melodyne 5 has the amazing anti-sibilant thing or you can actually use that for curse words. Is that one of your tools that you like to use? I do use Mel Melodyne. I use it mainly when I want to do tuning where um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a singer that's sensitive about people knowing that there's tuning there or they want it to sound a lot more natural. Mm -hmm. um, I will use Metal Dine. Um, 
And then sometimes it just helps to be able to, for instance, the, the artist may want the auto-tune sound mm-hmm. and then the auto-tune just isn't correct in a certain curve or a certain note, right? I'll just leave that particular note out of the auto-tune um, mm-hmm. spectrum and then tune it in Melodyne to give it a nice little feel. So sometimes mm-hmm. it's really just about going over the things I auto-tune and fine-tuning them, make them feel a little better. Or, um, like I said, a vocalist, like, um, particularly, uh, I just mixed up not too long ago, a gospel um, song, and she needed some tune. Like, you can tell she was off on certain notes, but mm-hmm. she made it very clear. She was like, I don't want to sound like I'm auto-tuned. Like, sure. I don't want that robotic sound. And I was like, sure. cool, I'll use metal line. Yes. She got the vocal back, and she was like, oh, my God, this is amazing. Yeah. I love doing Melodyne in front of the client. Literally, <laughs> after they yeah. just sang and they and they just come over and kiss me they're just it's yeah. like it's like yeah. you just made me sound like the best version of me without sounding like autotune you know right it's yeah. just it's just amazing what you can, what amazing. can do so let's get on to, uh, and i love this question uh, uh in mixing happy for pharrell what was your initial approach uh speaking of melodyne um perfect yeah. transition so mixing happy first thing i did i tuned some of the vocals pharrell is not a singer He's not the best singer, and he knows it. Um, so right away, he was like, hey, man, dude, g- give me all the help you can give me. Make me sound mm-hmm. good. So I initially tuned his lead and some of the backgrounds, not all of them, really just his mm-hmm. with Melodyne, and then I put Auto-Tune on them afterwards. Um, Auto-Tune is like the staple plug-in um, because it's, it's a vibe, and it's actually, a lot of times, Auto-Tune becomes a part of the sound. Yes. But sometimes they just like the sound of what it does to their voice. Yeah, it sounds um, modern. Yeah, it sounds modern. Yeah, but the young lady who sang the background, her name is Rhea. Uh, she didn't need any tuning. She's amazing. Um, so none of her vocals are tuned. And then I just went through my process. I start with vocals first when I when I mix, usually. Um, that's my process because it's easier on my ears. I like to kind of focus on the vocals first. Then I move to the drums, get the drums sounding right, move to the bass, make sure that they work together right. And then I bring in all the other instruments and then I bring the vocals back in. Um, that was pretty much my process on Happy. Happy was actually a pretty quick mix. Um, wasn't mm-hmm. a whole lot to it. Didn't use a ton of plugins. The vibe was already there. Yeah, very, um, very well recorded. Everything. Like I said, uh, Pharrell, initially when he when, when we had the conversation, he was like, hey, and that was, that Happy was in the early stages of me working with Pharrell. I'd only mixed one other project with him before. Um, so this was still in my kind of like, not really proving phase, but kind of, because like I said, I only mixed uh, one other project that had like four songs on it. It was a young lady. Her name was Leah LaBelle. That was the first thing I mixed with Pharrell. She actually passed away a couple of years ago in a car mm. accident. Mm. But um, she was the first project I mixed and then Happy. And so mm. Happy, I was still in the kind of courting phase with Pharrell, trying to figure out what he likes, what he doesn't like. So it was important to have those conversations with him. Like, so... Um, what are you looking for? What is the feel? So he told me he wanted to kind of feel like this and like, hey, yeah, and like so-and-so. And mm-hmm. he named a few songs. And I made sure I got those songs that he named, threw them right in the session so I can always refer back to them and, and kind of make sure I was keeping in line with the feel. And it was it was a pretty quick mix. I mixed that song in probably maybe five, six hours. Mm-hmm. Nice, nice. Okay, so this is another great question. What's the major difference between mixing hip-hop and mixing a live band? Like live um, versus program. Mixing hip hop, usually what you have is program drums. You have drum machines. A lot of the drums are either tuned well or there's sounds that work well together. Um, so, and a lot of times with hip hop, sounds aren't meant to always sound great together. Sometimes the organized confusion of it um, is actually part of the vibe. With live stuff, the thing you run into most, especially with drums, is phasing. You, you got to make sure everything is working right, the, mm-hmm. you know, make sure the drums are tuned um, correctly to each other, um, making sure things are locked in. When you got a live player, you, you tend to have some drift. Um, and, and that might be what the, the feel of the song calls for. So it's not about making it sound robotic, um, but it's also about making sure that um, you're, you're honoring a lot of the live Think, you know, live instrumentation calls for nuance. It calls for, you know, swells and dynamics. Mm-hmm. And you got to mm-hmm. honor all that. Where with hip hop, that's not a lot of your concern because if it's coming out of a drum machine, it's it's a loop, it's a sample, it's a straight beat with some drums or, 
you know, so with live, you have a lot more nuance to honor and pay attention to. Mm, okay. You know, I like this one. Uh, you have production credits on the Carter One. Uh, are there other times you've produced or made beats for artists? Yeah. Um, production is not something I love doing. So I love mixing. Um, production is just a product of, hey, I, I'm, I'm musically inclined. I, I mess around. I do beats every now and then. I, I write songs. Um, so yeah, Car um, with Wayne, I did one on there. Um, I've done one with Ice Cube. I've done one with Snoop. When Snoop was trying to be a reggae artist and he was Snoop Lion, <laughs> I did. Uh, I actually produced two songs on there on that nice. album. Nice. Uh, I did one on Monica back in the day. I did a song on Shanice back in the day. Shanice was a, a mid '90s uh, R&B artist. Um, so I had a couple credits. I had, I had some production credits. Mac Ten. Mm -hmm. I did a couple records with Mac Ten, rapper back in the day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. West mm -hmm. West Side. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Boy, there's so many great questions here. Where do I go for? Um, how long did you intern before getting your first paying gig? Do you think that time frame has changed today? It, it differs for every person and a lot of some of the factors. Okay, so for me, it took about a little less than a year, I think. Um, and that factor is different for, for everybody based on different things. Like uh, it could be based on the necessity of jobs that open up or assistant gigs that open up. Um, it could be just the culture of that studio. If you're at a larger studio where people tend to want to be some of the more famous or popular studios in that city, you may have a, a bit of a competition or a bit of a weight to, you know, if you're at one of the larger name studios. Um, if you're at a smaller, more boutique, um, independent type studio, you may come up a little faster. It just depends. Um, and then it also depends on your attitude and what you do with your internship. A lot of times, I, like I said, people tend to treat their internships like they're not important. And to me, an internship can turn out to be one of the most important tools you have in impressing someone. Because what you're doing when you're cleaning toilets and going for food and everything else is you're showing somebody your character. You're showing somebody your work ethic, you're showing how you do things and especially how you do things that you don't want to do. That's the, to me, the mark of a, a really good um, person and a person that can really go far is if they're really good at doing things they don't want to do and, and they do them with integrity and they do them, you know, well, and it's, it's, so it's, it's really a proving ground. Um, so a lot of, I think a lot of your internship can be determined by how hard you work, how committed you are, how much you don't complain. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's other circumstances there's other outside circumstances that you can't control and you just got to hang in there and it's different for different people. I've, I've known interns that interned for a month and got on. I've mm -hmm. known interns that interned for three years and, you know, finally got their break and they was willing to stick with it. And, you know, mm -hmm. so it just depends. Right. Usually it's, 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 you know, somewhere in the, in the frame of a year, a mm -hmm. little less than a year of I've, I've most average internship terms have been around a year. Yeah. yeah. I've this, the advice I used to give my students when, when it was still an intern thing going on, you know, and, and that was the, the goal of a student was to move to a place that you could afford to live for a year, live with an uncle, live with somebody that you could afford to live very cheaply for a, for a year, you know, that, yeah. so, so, uh, and that, so that brings me segue into this question, which is what's, what's the best way an online student, someone who doesn't have the goal of going to a studio and being an intern to make a difference and get in the business um, just have skills, you know, you know, it's interesting. So I've met stu online students that have, um, I've wanted to always pursue and, and mentor because they had something that I needed at the time. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I met a student, student online, I was doing an online seminar and the student hit me up and he was like, Hey man, if you ever need a logo, I can, you know, send you some logo design ideas. Cause I yeah, did yeah. that on the side. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Hey man, if you ever need anybody to tune any vocals for you and you don't feel like doing it, give me a shot, just shoot me the session. I'll tune them for you and see if you like it. I ended up using some vocals that a student did for me one time. Um, so it's just, it's different ways to interact. And especially because everything we do is on this digital medium, there's ways you can offer your help, your services, um, you know, all kind of stuff. And just, just stay engaged with that person. Yeah. Okay. There's two questions came up about 
DAWs and, and Windows. I'm going to answer them both. I'm going to ask them both in the, in the same question. Okay. And uh, the first one was if somebody sends you a question, uh, a session that was created on a Windows platform and, and it didn't use AU plugins um, or AX, I'm sorry, AX Pro Tools plugins uh, on Windows, what do you, what, how do you get around that? Um, well, for to save me time and to make it efficient for me, I always get them to, like, if they're using, let's say, Logic or a platform that doesn't open up as a Pro Tools session, mm -hmm. then I just tell them export their files as a way, consolidated wave files. Sure. So what that means is you're just sending me all the wave files from the session that consolidated from the exact same point so that when you drop all the wave files in, they line up exactly how they're supposed to line up. Sure. So that's usually the easiest, quickest way to get stuff from people who work on different. What uh, is the percentage that you're getting tracks like that versus Pro Tools sessions? Um, mostly get Pro Tools. Um, okay. If I had to say maybe 20%, maybe a Really? Bit. Yeah. Yeah, most, a lot of times what you'll find is you'll get sessions like, there's two, it, it might actually be a higher percentage. There's two forms of, of when you get sessions like that. It's usually the younger producers or mm -hmm. um, engineers who can't afford Pro Tools mm -hmm. who want or, or they just came up on a system like Cubase or sure. something that they're just used to, could even GarageBand or whatever. The second thing is Logic is more of a producer's tool. Yep. So a, a lot of producers like to work in Logic. And so, you know, a lot of times, yeah, I just tell them, hey, send me the Logic files, but just don't uh, don't send me the Logic files. What you do right. is just export your files as consolidated wave files, and then we're good. Yeah. It, it's the quickest, easiest way to get stuff done from so that was the second question is do you ever open up any other doll besides pro tools no no okay yeah it, it, it just make my life too difficult and I yeah just, i just i don't even have logic on my I, i'm sure I, I think i have a version of logic on my computer I don't really know. but yeah i just only pro tools it's it's just it's just the industry standard and, yes okay yeah. this is a good one from jose uh, how do you treat a project that sounds too thin um, depends. I hope, hopefully there's something for me to work with there where I can beef it up, where I can add some low end, where I can, you know, add some oomph. Um, a lot of, again, depending on what you're working on, working with, there's a lot of great low end shaping tools like the Waves makes the Submarine, mm -hmm. uh, UAD. One of my favorite plugins is the Little Labs Voice of God. Mm -hmm. Um, that plugin is amazing. Um, so you find those low end shaping low end resonance tools and you try to beef things up. Um, and then sometimes it can be just a product of just EQing the low end frequencies, just with a basic SSL EQ or Avid EQ and, and, you know, just working with what you have. So, uh, you know, and, and, and you can also, like I said, because I have a subtractive mentality, if things are sounding too thin and top and top endy, you might want to back off some of the high mids. Absolutely. It just depends. Yeah. Great. This is a great question by Scott. Um, do you feel like you can effectively mix in headphones? I've recently got the Slate VSX to emulate high-end mix rooms. Do you, do you ever use anything like that, like Sonoworks Reference 4, to mix in headphones when traveling? I've, I've tried. Um, yeah, and I've, I've actually done mixes in headphones. Uh, I think once you understand the craft and understand how to navigate sound and then always check it somewhere else. Yes. Um, but yeah, I've mixed records in headphones and I've been successful at it. And it, it's all about what your ears um, are used to, what you can kind of translate with what you're hearing. Um, but I always recommend when you're mixing headphones, check it somewhere um, where you can actually monitor it on some, you know, monitors. Yeah. Yes. But yeah. Yes. It's, it can be done. Yeah. We're getting towards close to the end here, but I, there's a couple of really great questions I want to hit to. Um, okay. What what's your favorite way to double vocals? Not ones that came to you doubled, but ones when you were trying to duplicate them and you know in in the track. Do you and the triple vocals? Do you uh, is there a case where you where you're doing and you don't want to do that? Where you, it's not good? A way that you you say is doubling is not a good way to double. Um, I tend to use the double of four. Um, I've used the auto auto tune has a um a. a pitch doubler thing. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't use it much, but if it comes on the session, I kind of think it's cool. Double or four is um, waves. I, waves. Yes. Yes. The yes double or four is waves. Yes. Yeah. And I, I, I typically don't, that's not my thing. I usually just try to work with what's there. Right. Um, 
And if I feel like something really needs to be doubled, I would try to encourage the artist to double it. Um, but if I have to throw some stuff on it, a double four yeah. does the trick. Do you like the Dimension D and ever the UAD Dimension D where it just gives a little width on? I'm, I've thing? never, I, 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 well, I shouldn't say I've never. I don't typically use it, no. But yeah, okay, I mean, yeah, yeah. I yeah, do yeah. like it, but I, I don't typically. It's not one of my go tos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so that brings us up to th what are your thoughts on parallel compressing the whole mix? Have you ever done that? I have not. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I have not. I'm, I'm almost certain that I probably would get into that kind of stuff if I am fortunate enough to keep mixing with David Guetta. Um, you know, that his world kind of encompasses a lot of that kind of like parallel compression and all that stuff. So we'll see as I get into mixing with him, if, if I start picking up some techniques on, on or, or doing that more on those type of mixes, but typically no. Yes. Okay. So Yancey, this is the student I was telling you about that he said he, he is the reason he came, you are the reason he came to full sail. So um, yeah, his name is Yancey and uh, he's, he's a really great student of mine. And his question came up is, have you found any disadvantages when you're mixing in your truck, ver truck versus a control room? Um, just having to get in and out to pee um, can be a bit of a task. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But other than that, I mean, no, not really. Um, I actually like it. I, like I said, I, I like mixing in there. I feel like I'm in my own world. So you're in the um, back seat or the front seat? So I'm in the back, in the third row. And third then row. the speakers sit on the second row. Ah. The captain's chairs are folded down and I have Got the speakers it. sitting there. Got and it. I sit on the third row seat. And I have Got like it. a little desk that I yeah, yeah, put yeah. in there. So Got in order it. to get in and out of the truck, I go through the trunk. So yeah, I like yeah, yeah, yeah. through the trunk. Because I don't want to like step over the speakers or whatever. So of course, of that course. part is, you know, can be a bit of a headache. Yeah. yeah. Um, so your sub is right but, in your butt there. You're right. Your sub is right behind you. No, the sub actually. So I, I put my KRK sub in there. Oh, I thought you were. So the that sits yeah. between the captain's chairs. Like the captain's Got chairs it. are folded down. And then the KRK sub um, sits between them. Nice, nice. Hey, you know, when you find something that works, that's just, that's just magical. Hey. You know, <laughs> yeah, but no, no disadvantages. I actually really like it. Um, and, oh, and other than the fact that every now and then, so um, my Escalade has this thing where after a couple of hours, which is good timing anyway, it, it shuts off. Right. I literally have to like restart my car every yeah. like, three hours, I think. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. but. Okay. Three hours is too long to be sitting in one place anyway. So. There you go. Okay, so this is a great question from Michael. What, is, what near, field mon near field monitors would you recommend for mixing hip-hop and urban music? Um, I, I mean, the ones I use, I absolutely love. I use, um, these are more mids than, than super near. Um, these are near to mids. Um, the Focal Twin mm -hmm. 6 BEs, those nice. are the ones I use. Yeah. Um, With a sub. Any of the Focal lineup, it, they all sound amazing to me. I love right. those. Right, and that's with a sub. You need a sub. Yeah, with all and then them. I use a KRK sub. I use a KRK SHO twelve. I love the KRK subs a because of the price point, and you can mm -hmm. beat them up. Like, and they sound really good, and you can beat them up um, for you know, cut like twelve, thirteen hundred dollars, and you can really push that thing, and it it delivers. Yes, yes, great. That's a great answer. Okay, I love this question. Um, do you start with the static mix or go with the project file you were sent? In other words, when you were sent a Pro Tool session, do you pull all the faders down or do you start with where it is? I always start with where it is. I never pull all the faders down. I think that's one of the cardinal sins, in, especially in my world, where it's hip-hop, R&B, pop type stuff. A lot of times, especially in the world we work in now where artists, the artists and the producers have the tools we have. They work mm -hmm. on Pro Tools, they have plugins, mm -hmm. they try things. So they're creating the vibe as they go. And what they're looking to me to do, uh, my, my role in most of the stuff in, in these days, they're looking to me to enhance the vibe and not create a vibe. They don't want me to just start from scratch. So I think back in the day that was more applicable because the recording process was so separate from the mix process. Now it's almost like just another phase where, you know, like I said, they're recording, then they're throwing plugins on it and then they're using this and using that. And then they want you to carry that vibe over into the mix. So for me, it, it I would be working backwards if I tried to like, if I get a session and then break it down to zero and then try to start and recreate the vibe that they're looking for. Yeah. It, 
that wouldn't make any sense to me. So yes. I always start from where they are. A lot of times if they have a, a few plugins on there already, I'll go with their plugins and then just add my chain or I try to just really, because to me, the thing is about mixing is it's about honoring the feel. Mm. The feel is created a lot of times in the recording and, and you can't go too far away from what made them fall in love with the song in the first place. That's right. And a lot of times you'll be fighting, you'll, you'll have, they have demoitis. <laughs> That's right. They want it to yeah, sound yeah. a lot like, they don't want it to sound too different from what they sent you. They just want it to yeah. sound better. Better. So, right, exactly. Yeah. Cool. So this is, I think this leads right into this question. Is there ever occasion where you wouldn't add a reverb to a vocal? Like hip hop, is that, do, do you add a reverb to a hip hop vocal and people say, take that off or what, where does that stand? Um, usually you tend not to go too hard on vocals. I think with the younger trap style music, like the little Uzi verse and the Gunners, mm -hmm. they like a lot of vocals on it, uh, a lot of reverb on their vocals. Right, right. Um, so I tend, and again, with them, the vocals come that way. I tend to just kind of feed off of where they are and what they're doing. A lot of times they'll send their stuff like Uzi, when I'm mixing his stuff, he'll send his stuff with a ton of reverb on it. Right. I'm, just going, I'm rocking with that. It wouldn't oh, be really? my preference. Right. I, I remember when I first started mixing Lil Uzi Bird, I was like, man, it's way too much reverb on it. Yeah. Bird. But that's yeah. what he liked. New style. So I just rock with it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, let me see. Uh, oh, this is a good question. When you're interning at a studio, is it worthwhile to spend time building up a portfolio on the side to help on the side to help potentially advance yourself further? Sure, and 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 building up a portfolio is also to help you learn and help you grow. But yes, yeah, always worth it to to do things on the side in your free time. Do stuff. That's how you get better at anything creative is by doing. So just keep doing it, keep messing with it. But like I said, don't lose focus on the fact that as an intern, your next, what you're also focusing on is what's the next step? What is the job that's going to get me to my next step? Focus on that job too. Yeah, great. Um, how can students get, we, since we're coming to 1130, which is this AMA, it turned to an AMA here. It's really gone. We've gone across the board to ask you anything, you know. Hey, it's uh, all good. Uh, um, yeah. So uh, the, a lot of this came up with how can students get in contact with you or if you do any mentorship or if you had any advice on the side to students, uh, what, how do you recommend they do All that? the time. And, and students know um, one of my more popular ways of doing things now is, I, and, and I'll be happy to give them my email. It's lesterbud at AOL.com. Yes, I'm still rocking the AOL. Nice. Um, but one of the cool things I do now, I try to do it every night. Um, I'm a gamer. I love gaming. And that's one of the things I do in my like download time to kind of like chill. You know, when I finish mixing at night, I'll get on and play games. So what I've been doing is I get on Twitch. I stream my games. I stream me playing Call of Duty with friends. Nice. And then what I do is I take questions while I'm playing. So I do this Q&A thing um, where I'm playing Call of Duty and you can get on the chat in, in my Twitch and ask me questions. And we have good conversations about audio. The name of my, my stream is um, 808s and Supply Crates. And uh, <laughs> Supply Crates references uh, the crates that you find in Call of Duty. Sure. And we all know what 808s are. So... Um, yeah, I get on there every night from midnight to about 4 a.m. Um, mm. Some mm. nights I miss it, but for the most part, I'm on there pretty much every night. So I would say that's a good way. I've, I have quite a few full sale students that hop on there every night with me. On Twitch. Yeah. On yeah. Twitch. And nice. they ask questions all the time. They'll put questions in the chat. And as I'm playing and killing that's people funny. on Call of Duty, I'll be like, oh, yeah. Um, what's your vocal chain? Oh, yeah. So my vocal chain is, and I'm sitting there playing. And yeah, I'm yeah, yeah. Talking. That's funny. So a, I feel like it's a good, fun way to kind of interact and answer questions. So that's a good way to get in touch with me. Get on my Twitch. My Twitch is Lester Bud. It's uh, Twitch, you know, backslash Lester Bud. Uh -huh. Twitch.com, whatever. You just nice. search for Lester Bud on Twitch. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, I'm, I'm on there pretty much every night, like I said, and it's a cool way to interact with me. And I, I found that to be a little more effective because what happens is I may get a ton of emails, but I don't have the time to answer them all. Of course, all the time. of course, of course. So I, I don't want, I, ever, I don't ever want students to think I'm ignoring them. Or of course. Sometimes it's just an indictment on, I just can't get to all the emails. But Right, right. So just to repeat, very it, cool Lester, Bud, Lester Bud on Twitch and Lester Bud at AOL on email. That's what question came up with. 
Yep. 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 Okay. So that's cool. a cool way to interact with me and cool, cool, cool. cool. So it stuff. is eleven thirty-two, and uh, you know, I think we've uh, we've covered you know all the major foods food uh, camps here that we've needed to cover. You, we've covered <laughs> the gamut from uh, you know the work how the work you do and the, how you work with clients to the individual plugins to the individual sessions, and uh, so you know, I really appreciate your time, Leslie. This has been this has been incredible, and uh, I know the students are just you know. They're so excited to be able to uh, talk to uh, you know the leaders of the industry, and that's that's what that's one of the strengths of full sale. So I don't know if you want to have any closing remarks to, uh, to um, just you know stick with it. I know this year has been challenging for all of you. It's COVID. You haven't been on campus. If you're used to being on campus, just you know stick with it. I think full sale has done an amazing job of dealing with the pandemic, transitioning to make things work out for you guys. And so, sorry, but nice. my dog is going crazy. Nice. <laughs> Sebastian, calm down. <laughs> so, um, yeah, my advice is just stick with it. Um, have faith in, in Full Sail and the way they've tailored the education to you guys. You're not missing out on anything. I think things have transitioned really well. Um, and just, you know, just always strive to be great. Uh, I'll be on again tomorrow with Tremaine. That'll be fun. Um, Yay. I have a couple of panels with you, man. I think I have one at 11 and one at one o'clock. So that's wow. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. All right. Leslie, thank you so much for your time, your energy and your, your incredible enthusiasm for full sale. And, and, you know, and I wish you all the best in these, in this time period. And, uh, and we're moving into a new era and uh, thank you Atlanta for everything Atlanta has done for the moving into this new era. Had to, had to be said, had to be said. Yeah. And, and, and hopefully January will move us into the further into that area. Era. Right. So, um, uh, enough said. So uh, uh, we'll be we'll be calling a day here, but uh, this has been archived, so people will be able to see this uh, this AMA here, this incredible AMA here. So, Always great to do these. Always all right, a pleasure. All right, take care, my friend. All right, Joe. Bye bye.